and uh, good morning for those of you who are in the US. My name is Marco Becht and I'm the executive director of the ECGI. As many of you, so I'll say a few opening words and then I'll turn over to Lucrezia Reitlin and she'll turn over to the organizers of the series. This is the first uh, of this series. So I'll say a few introductory remarks before we actually launch the seminar. Um, so as many of you know, ECGI is a global network and it has the purpose of improving corporate governance and stewardship through independent scientific research. It was set up in 2002, so almost 20 years ago. And our tagline is leading research with global impact. Um, now, one of the main tools for making the research of the ECGI researchers available to a wider audience is our working paper series. And in the past, these working papers are typically discussed at conferences and physical meetings uh, all over the globe. Now, with the move to online, this type of physical meeting and discussion of the work is no longer possible. Um, however, people are more willing to meet and engage online, uh, which actually fits our global reach. So together with the editors of the working paper series, we decided to launch a new initiative. And this is the first one today, the ECGI Spotlight series. So what is this about? How is it going to work? Well, the series will be online, as you can see, and each session will be no longer than 60 minutes. Today's an exception, will be 15 minutes longer because I'm speaking, so I'll shut up very soon. Uh, it will feature relevant and exciting papers that have appeared in the ECGI working paper series. Uh, it's initially going to take place uh, in Europe in the afternoon, in the US in the morning, and in a second stage, uh, we will try to add an Asian version, which will be in Europe in the morning and in Asia in the evening. Um, the, today we have uh, a very interesting paper on the program and I'm sure others will follow. Um, the, uh, just two words about the uh, series. So the editor of the law series is Amir Licht. He's with us uh, here. I think you're there, Amir, so you can raise your hand. Uh, we have uh, Mike Burkhardt who edits the finance series. And uh, we also have Miriam Schwartz-Ziv and Tom Voss, and they together will be producing the Spotlight series. Now, and in fact, since it's a finance paper we have today, Miriam and Mike will be hosting today's session. Um, but before I turn to them, let me just in briefly introduce our new chair, the chair of ECGI, Lucrezia Reitlin. She's also here. Um, and she was only elected a few days ago as the chairman of the board, as the chair of the board, I should say. Uh, so just one sentence of introduction. So Lucrezia is a macroeconomist and an econometrician. She's a former director of research at the European Central Bank, a trustee of the CPR and the IFRS Foundation. And there she has a particular responsibility for climate disclosure. Uh, and she's also a non-executive director on several company boards. Uh, so, Lucrezia, I think uh, that's my bit, and I turn it over to you. Thank you, Marco. Uh, it is indeed a, a pleasure to introduce this series, uh, and in fact, this is the first thing I'm, I do as, as a new chair, because I was uh, literally, uh, you know, elected a few days ago. Uh, I just want to say a few things. I mean, this is one of the uh, many initiatives uh, we are planning uh, in order to leverage uh, the, the research of the network uh, to make it more visible, not only in the academic communities, but also in the wider community of uh, regulators, uh, of uh, you know, investors, uh, policymakers, uh, companies, and so on, and to you know, make it uh, even more global than it already is. And indeed, I mean, the the fact that the world is partially going, uh, uh, you know, virtual, it is in a way an opportunity. Although we hope that sometimes, uh, you know, we will, you know, have also the opportunities to have physical meetings. So as Marco said, uh, I have never worked as a research, I'm an academic, but I've never worked as a researcher on corporate governance issues. But the reason why I accepted uh, to become chair of this uh, incredibly interesting network is because uh, in my various hats as, uh, uh, you know, being the board members of companies and uh, lately, especially uh, as a trustee of FRS, uh, I've come to the conclusion that actually governance uh, and stewardships uh, are incredibly important topics uh, uh, in this phase in which uh, 
basically we are discussing about uh, the future of capitalism and uh, you know and you know the, to have such an interdisciplinary uh, you know resource like the one that the ECGI offers uh, I think it's unique and uh, I think it's a you know it's a great honor to 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 chair this network and uh, you know I like uh, to push it as much as possible from the point of view of a user okay because I think you know that uh, I am not a contributor as a researcher but uh, definitely I'm a consumer so uh, I think also COVID has accelerated the importance of the topic uh, you're dealing with and uh, so and I, I think I'm really looking forward to you know to participate to this series as much as, as I can uh, so um, and you know I just really that's all I want to say so in, in the interest of time let me just uh, hand over to Mike Burkert who is the editor of the ECGI financial series working paper financial series and to Miriam uh, schwartz -V, who will introduce the paper today and, um, and uh, you know, have a good um, afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lucrezia. As Marco and Lucrezia already said, as I together with Miriam will be uh, chairing uh, today's session. Huh? And we are pretty delighted that so many of you joined us today for a paper, or a topic we believe is really e exciting. So first of all, we know quite a bit about hedge fund activists who go long, long, and they are actually pretty controversial. We also know quite a bit about short selling, which is also controversial or even more controversial, and at some times has even been banned. Now, if you combine the activist with the short selling, then it gets really controversial, and we're really looking forward to learn more and hear more about this today. So we are very happy to have Slava Foss from Boston College, who is doing various uh, uh, corporate finance work and all of it quite interesting. And we will look forward to the presentation of Slava. But before I'm giving Slava the word, let me have Miriam explain to you the rules of engagement. Please, Miriam. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Um, okay, so let me start by saying a few words about the structure of our meeting today. Uh, so starting from now, it will be about an hour long. Um, Slava will present his paper for 20 minutes. Um, and his presentation will be followed by comments uh, by Stephen Fraden for about 15 minutes. Stephen was the vice chairman of Pershing Square Capital, one of the largest long activist hedge funds in the world. Today, he's a partner with Cad Walter, Rickerman, and Taft. We will then have a Q&A session that will start with a few invited questions um, by senior corporate finance scholars. After the invited questions, we will open the floor for questions. If you have any questions, please raise your hand and write your question in the Q&A or the chat box and Mike or I will call upon you. Please indicate if you wish to present your question or if you prefer that one of the chairs do this. So you can pick whichever option you prefer. We are now happy to have Slava present his paper, Active Short Selling by Hedge Funds. Thanks, Miriam. Uh, thanks, everyone, for organizing this, um, I hope, first but not the last uh, uh, presentation in the series of papers. Having all of you on this um, Zoom call is amazing. I think we have so many intellectuals who contributed to this, this research area and we, Ian and I, who is, uh, Ian is co-author on this paper, we're really looking forward to your comments. Um, as, as Mike said, basically in this paper, we're going to combine two strands of the literature. On one side, we'll look at hedge funds and particularly you'll see activist hedge funds. On the other side, we'll, we'll see what, is, what role do they play in a relatively new phenomenon, which we call active short selling. Let me now share a screen. So again, this is co-author of paper with Ian. He is here as well and can handle the hardest questions if necessary. So short sellers, we know that probably it's obvious and doesn't need to be even written on the slide that they play, play very important role in transmission of negative information into prices. 
Many market participants, of course, enjoy the benefits of that. However, short sellers are often criticized because when they transmit that information, they uh, definitely hit, hit very hard people who have long positions in security. So if you look at history, short sellers often were cast as, you know, not positive players in the history. People blame short sellers for all bad things that have ever happened, including Black Tuesday, Black Monday, financial crisis. Uh, I put here on slide a few quotes that people basically use to label short sellers. You, you can see that the ne ne negativity of the sentiment to get short sellers is really uh, uh, strong. So if, if you think about the sentiment in the market and you also look at what happens once short positions become publicly uh, uh, um, observable, you also can see uh, extensive amount of litigation against, against short sellers. You can see even the SEC and the FBI investigating short sellers uh, uh, in, in often criminal investigations. So, Moreover, management can often use corporate policies to, uh, to further make life of short sellers quite hard. It can engage, uh, uh, companies can engage in, for example, large dividend payments that may make short sellers hurt. Of course, they can also uh, 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 engage in more positive uh, uh, guidance about earnings and, uh, and steps as uh, similar to, to, to basically maybe even reducing access to, to uh, earnings calls. Now, uh, there was a paper uh, that published in the in 2016 that indeed shows that once Europe passed uh, a regulation that requires short sellers to disclose their positions, the level of short selling activity dropped, which is consistent with the idea that short sellers do not like being seen. They don't enjoy this idea of being publicly observable and subject to all this criticism. And this is basically where we started seeing a new phenomenon, the rise of uh, high profile short campaigns in recent years. And this is what is our goal. We want to study these um, campaigns in which uh, hedge funds engage in short selling. And uh, the key here is going to be that they uh, actively engage in discussion of these positions. So let me start from one example. This is uh, Einhorn versus Light Capital. Basically, in May 2002, Einhorn uh, announced a short position in, in Light Capital. Uh, by now, I just mean it's not a formal disclosure. It's really voluntarily decision to, to, uh, to disclose such a position. Uh, uh, the fund accused firm in using accounting gimmicks to hide losses. Immediate stock price response was really clear, negative 10%. Now, this is when the interesting things actually started. The ACC, as immediate response, actually started investigating the hedge fund, not the company. So in, 2000, in June 2002, uh, Einhorn uh, uh, began, began engaging in this SEC investigation. Now, only two years later, the Security Exchange Commission switched focus to a light capital. And actually, the main focus on the investigation was what David Anhor actually claimed in his uh, uh, initial statement in 2002. Uh, three years later, a um, uh, company settled with the SEC. There was no financial penalty, but probably this is the most painful financial penalty is that they were acquired at 90% discount relative to the peak value. So there was at least part of this valuation reduction obviously can be attributed to, to the short seller. Um, in a sense, short seller makes sure that the negative news about the company were revealed sooner rather than later. And when David Einhorn describes his experience with this case in the book that he wrote, he says that after I look back at what happened to me when I engaged in this uh, campaign, it's not clear why uh, so many short sellers decide to remain private and not talk about what they're doing. Now, um, in this paper, we're going to ask how common is it for hedge funds to, to engage in uh, such campaigns? And just to give you a preview of the results, we're going to see that since 2008, we have about 30 high profile campaigns a year that are prim primarily initiated by activist hedge funds. So again, our study is based on no hedge funds, but one of key results is that we see that activist hedge funds are much more likely to engage in these campaigns. 
we can look at allegations that they make and allegations related to valuation, uh, which is probably more general allegation, but also fraud, problems with business model, etc. We see uh, significant effects of these campaigns on valuation of securities. We see that as a market participants respond to that, we see that after this campaign, short sellers become more active, and also there is increase in litigation against companies. Uh, these effects are going to be stronger when hedge funds have experience in activism, and actually even more so when that experience is uh, such that they actually have, uh, uh, have engaged in many hostile activism campaigns. We're also going to see that these effects are going to be stronger when hedge funds not just say that we think securities are overvalued, but rather they say that there is a very specific problem with the company. It looks like market is going to reward specific allegations about the companies, about companies rather than just general statements about the allegation. Um, so why hedge funds? Why hedge funds is, is basically the core of this study. Uh, first of all, they manage trillions of the dollars that are big players in the market. Uh, uh, second, they probably are most active short sellers overall. If you think about uh, the extent of short selling that is taking place, probably the vast majority of it is beyond, uh, done by hedge funds. And one of papers cites a number of about 80%, that about 80% of short selling activity in the market is done by hedge funds. Now, if you think about disclosure of short positions, why would hedge funds tell publicly what they're doing. This is where, where it becomes actually not clear because on one side, uh, hedge funds uh, can, can be very aggressive short sellers. They can, they can find many problems and talk about it publicly. So that would say we should expect many such campaigns. On top of that, we also know that hedge funds and particularly activist hedge funds often do not have any problem with confronting management and companies. They are accustomed to that. They, 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 they do it usually when they engage in long campaigns and don't succeed. This is when they become quite hostile. On the other side, we know that one of key features of hedge funds is that they value privacy. They don't like talking about what they're doing uh, uh, and, and they don't like to do any disclosure once regulators ask them to do. So basically, um, uh, a final point here that we want to make, hedge funds are also quite well positioned to deal with risks that are associated with short selling. They have contractual provisions that limit withdrawal of capital. They can handle, uh, uh, to some extent, short squeezes if they, if they happen. Of course, there is limit to everything. Um, now, we actually wanted to focus on hedge funds precisely uh, because um, uh, uh, Alexander uh, Lundquist and Crown in 2016 our first paper already looked at public disclosure of short campaigns of short selling positions. And this is, I think, the first paper in the literature to do that. Um, and and uh, they make a very important point that if you look at small arbitrage, for them speaking publicly is one way to resolve limits to arbitrage because they have limited capital. They, they cannot short engage in large short positions. So for them, speaking publicly is really helpful. Uh, we are going to talk a lot about that because if you think about hedge funds and particularly differences between activist hedge funds and non-activist hedge funds, that should be less of a concern because hedge funds as a group can deal with uh, 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 limits to arbitrage and also there is no a priori difference between activists and, and not activist hedge funds. And again, we'll, we'll get back to that later. There is also a paper that looks at uh, uh, short uh, uh, selling campaigns uh, that revealed on Seeking Alpha and uh, 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 argues that these campaigns are activism campaigns. I will later uh, express our opinion on that. And I, I think the economic activity that they describe here is not likely to be activism. So I think our main insights into the literature is that what we study here is basically a phenomenon of strategic communication. When investors decide to use words and not just trading activity to transmit information into prices. There is all the economic literature that studies that. And I think we are one of the first empirical papers uh, that looks at how hedge funds engage in this uh, activity. 
what we're going to see again consistently with theoretical predictions, investor reputation and credibility of allegation are going to play important role in these campaigns. Our results will be uh, consistent with that. On top of that, one of uh, one of the things that we learned from this exercise, and I think theoretical literature needs to revisit it, is basically a very important difference between communication of positive information and negative information. As many panelists actually have, have shown in their papers, um, when, when hedge funds have uh, long positions and again engage in activism, very often these engagements will begin from private communication with targets. They're going to communicate to management and say, we believe that this and that can be improved. Let's work on that together. Only if it is fails, then hedge funds are going to move to this public, uh, 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 public aggressive uh, campaign where they confront management. We argue that if a hedge fund has negative information about the company, this is not the right path to follow because if you know, for example, that company engages in fraud, you do not want to go to management and talk about that because if they fix a problem, you will never realize financial benefits of that because the stock prices will not drop, you will not be able to materialize financial gains. So I think this fundamental asymmetry between long and short engagements that uh, has been studied in the feedback literature uh, by papers that we cite here needs to be uh, uh, first investigated as far as communication of information goes. Uh, we also contribute uh, to literature on short selling. We, are, we, we show here that short sellers can um, improve transmission of negative enterprises, information enterprises by talking. And again, here we'll build on papers by uh, uh, Alexander and Quinn in 2016. Um, we again, we, we also contribute to that literature by, show, by looking at a, a, a class of investors that a priori are not likely to be subject to limits to arbitrage. They have a lot of capital, they have contractual provisions. Uh, importantly, we again show that activist hedge funds will be much more likely to engage in these campaigns rather than general hedge funds. Um, our paper also contributes to the literature that studies activism campaigns by hedge funds, we're, what we're going to call long campaigns in this paper. Our contribution here is again show that skills that activist hedge funds have the, the ability to engage in, in uh, uh, hostile confrontations with companies are going to be used once they engage in short selling campaigns. Also, what we show here is again, this, the way hedge funds transmit information, positive information and, ne and negative information is quite different. And we believe that should be investigated going forward. Now, let me move to results and show you how we get to uh, all these conclusions. So the paper begins from uh, um, uh, uh, 1,200 hedge funds that report uh, uh, positions through Thomson uh, uh, 13F uh, uh, filings. Our sample period will cover 96 to 2015. Uh, we are going to use Factiva newspapers, blogs, uh, TV outlets, etc., to find any disclosure of short positions by these uh, investors. We're going to then uh, 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 show you what are typical ways to disclose it, what are typical allegations. So most of the time, newspaper and TV will be the typical uh, way to disclose these positions. Often hedge funds are going to do it in, in investor conference events. This is going to be a very important subsample that we're going to study later on. Um, uh, in our paper, we have 252 public short selling campaigns by uh, hedge funds. And uh, it is actually done by 51 hedge funds out of 1,200. So you see here quite extensive level of specialization. Not all hedge funds do it. Only some of them do. Um, this is time series distribution of events. You see that these campaigns become more and more visible. And actually, the year that the largest numbers of campaigns is the last year on our sample. So it's definitely relevant. It's happening. And I do want to tell you that we started analyzing this topic precisely because we saw so many Wall Street Journal articles about these events. We wanted to understand what is going on. Um, in terms of allegations, uh, in about 40% of cases, active short seller is going to say, I think security is overvalued. 
and this is going to be uh, actually uh, limited to that. Quite often, however, in more than 60% of cases, we see that hedge funds are going to make a very specific allegation about the company. They're going to say that there is a problem with product, like in Herbalife case. There is maybe a fraud case going on, or accounting gimmicks like in Allied, with Allied Capital. So very often these allegations are going, are going to be quite specific as, well, as, as we're going to see, this is going to be quite important for results. I will not show you tables, but just if you want to know what are typical targets, targets are actually typically large companies that are doing quite well, not only as far as accounting measures of performance go, but also as far as valuation goes. And this is not surprising because this is what short sellers target potentially overvalued uh, companies. Uh, as far as investors, again, out of 1,200 uh, hedge funds, we, we actually realized that the vast majority of these campaigns, about 208 out of 252, are uh, uh, initiated by activist hedge funds. And this is not to tell you that activist hedge funds are most of hedge funds in the universe. This is actually exactly the opposite. Activist hedge funds are about 25% of hedge fund universe, yet they engage in most of these campaigns. They're representative as far as these campaigns goes, go. And this is basically, this was one of first results for us to basically ask the question, why activist hedge funds? What is so special about them? Why they engage in most of these campaigns? Now we're going to look at valuation consequences of these campaigns. We also looked at campaigns that are announced at investor conferences. I'm not going to show you results, but just to tell you this is a very important subsample because the timing of the event is predetermined. These investor conferences happen regularly and basically hedge funds can decide whether they're going to talk about something or not. They cannot change the timing of the event, which addresses several concerns about maybe uh, 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 the occurrence of this uh, announcement with some other negative news. So the, the dark line in this figure shows you community of normal returns for, for targets of these campaigns. We see that there is positive trend before announcement, which is again consistent with companies being valued highly, their potential overvalued securities. You see that at time zero, this is when hedge fund publicly discloses uh, the short position. There is sharp decline in valuation uh, of more than 10% and then small reversal. In the dash line, what we are showing you here, it's a very important com control group, comparison group. These are basically cases when companies experience enormously large increases in short interest. By large, I mean more than 5% of shares will stand in a short within two weeks. This is extraordinary increase in short, short, short selling activity. We see that it also leads to negative price dynamics, but it is really not comparable to what we get when we see that uh, short sellers actually talk about what they're doing. Now, what is really comfort, comfortable for us is to see that pre-disclosure dynamics are very similar. Price patterns are quite comparable for cases when hedge funds decide to engage in active short selling and cases when short sellers just become to decide to be very aggressive but stay privately. However, after announcement, there is significant divergence of these uh, events. Okay, now let's look at other market participants. How are they going to respond to that? Uh, and this is what companies typically allege short sellers in. Basically, they say, okay, you, you disclose bombastic news, you talk to short sellers, you talk to analysts, press, you sue us, then many people follow up and then people start piling up on, 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 on us as, as, as targets. Uh, this is what, uh, again, companies often uh, accuse short sellers in doing. Let's see whether there is any ground for that. So when we look at short interest, and this is a simple regression that basically asks whether short interest uh, in general increases after these campaigns, we see indeed that short interest increases by about one percentage point of shares outstanding. Uh, now, I do want to emphasize this coefficient constant, which is 9.7%. It tells you that about 9% of shares is already short prior to campaign, to campaign disclosure. This is a very high number. 
it tells you that these companies already feel the pressure from short sellers. These are heavily shorted securities overall. Yet we see that short sellers do follow what activists are saying. As far as litigation goes, we see very similar results. We see that when campaigns are announced, companies experience more litigation. Uh, and again, this is after we control for short interest in, in general. So there is really incremental effect to this uh, uh, that we can attribute to active in engagements. Now, I think the most interesting part of the paper is basically to ask, okay, why this change in that taking place? What is economic story behind it? Why do hedge funds engage in, in this form of strategic communication? Okay, so, um, Slava, Slava I, I have to ask you to speed up severely. How many minutes do I have? Another three minutes. Three minutes is excellent. Thank you. I'll, I'll do my best. Um, again, one of key results to explain is that most of these campaigns are done by activists. And we want to understand why. Um, so the first thing that we're going to study is whether fund reputation plays a role. And here we're going to look at population of activist hedge funds and we're going to ask who is more likely to engage in these campaigns. Consistently with theoretical literature that thinks what type of investor should engage in communication of information uh, publicly, we see that experience or reputation, if you, if you measure it with just the number of campaigns that they do on the long side is positively correlated with active short selling. Also very significant and robust correlation of hostility. So hedge funds that are often hostile when they uh, engage in long activism, also going to be uh, very likely to engage in this uh, type of active short selling. So again, this is supports idea of investor reputation playing a key role. The last empirical result that I'm going to show you that the credibility of allegation also is very important. And here I give you a few sentences from David Einhorn book that again is saying that when they pick a company that they want to invest in, they don't just look at quantitative metrics of when security is overvalued or not. Actually, they first ask, and this is my emphasis added here, why company could be overvalued or undervalued. Basically what they want, they want to find the problem with the company. And only after that, they decide whether to engage in, in a long campaign and be, uh, if the problem is price and they can fix it or to engage in short active short selling campaign if for example they find fraud and market participants are not aware of that so let's look at this credibility of allegation when they actually reveal something specific does it play a role so basically what we're going to do now we're going to split campaigns into two parts campaigns where just general claims are made versus campaigns where there is something specific stated about the company we see here dramatic difference in patterns. Here you see stock price dynamics. When allegations are general and not specific, market doesn't buy, it, doesn't buy it. You see the price dynamics are indistinguishable from large increases in short positions. However, when hedge funds speak to details, when they provide something specific about com uh, companies, response becomes even more negative. And we find very similar results when we look at short interest Actually, this is a precisely estimated zero effect. Short sellers don't, don't pile in when someone talks about short position without giving any details. They simply don't respond to that. We see that short sellers respond only when a uh, hedge fund that it engages in active short selling actually gives them something specific. Same results for uh, lawsuits. Very, very large increases in litigation against companies when specific allegations are made, nothing when uh, um, we see that it's just general statement of evaluation. I feel that my time is up. I'm going to conclude. What do we study in this paper? We study here a, 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 a relatively new phenomena of active short selling campaigns. We, we limit this analysis to hedge funds. Uh, retail investors already have been again studied in the literature we find that the vast majority of campaigns leads to large negative effects on valuation and changes in behavior of market participants. We see that investor reputation and credibility for allegation play a key role in these campaigns 
And this is from our point of view, the main explanation for why activist hedge funds engage in this activity. And finally, I think more um, for theorists, my, my uh, most, I think, provocative result is that we really want to understand these incentives to engage in, in strategic communication when you have positive information and negative information. Empirically, it looks like it's very asymmetric. Institutions are very likely to speak privately if it is good news, but they're very not likely to speak privately when it is bad news. Actually, if they do, this engagement oh, no. Uh, I have to I'm cut done. you off. I have to cut you. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Slava. Now I give the screen to Stefan for the comments. Thank you, Stefan, for agreeing to comment. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, and, and I'd like to thank also a, uh, a young man named Jonathan Morford, who's a third year law student at the University of Virginia, who has helped me with my remarks. Uh, Slava, thank you for this uh, valuable paper, which I have found uh, very provocative and very interesting. The, um, let me just fix this, good, okay. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about my background, which is uh, relevant to my remarks. Uh, I'm now a partner at the Cadwallader firm in New York, but before that, for a few years, I was vice chairman of Pershing Square, which is a very large activist hedge fund. And during the period when I was at Pershing Square, it was uh, involved in two activist campaign, two uh, activist short selling campaigns, in one of which it was the short sell, in the other it uh, in fact suffered as a result of uh, the short campaign by someone else. So I have kind of an unusual uh, perspective. I'm going to try to be objective here, uh, although uh, I, I will acknowledge that I have some personal involvement in this situation. So my first observation about the paper is that I believe that the returns reflected uh, involve a weighting of, of, uh, of the returns and where uh, large companies uh, are obviously going to have more of an impact on uh, these numbers than smaller companies, uh, and I'm I'm not convinced uh, that it wouldn't be interesting to uh, disaggregate these numbers to some extent, so we had some idea of how uh, short campaigns work with respect to uh, medium-sized companies, small companies, and I also would be interested in, in, in seeing whether there are any outliers among the large companies that had an unusual impact uh, on, on the results. Uh, then a couple of observations about short and a couple of technical observations. First, uh, short selling is economically asymmetric. So the short seller who, for example, sells a stock uh, short at $20 uh, can profit between $20 and $0 if the stock drops to zero. On the other hand, if the short seller is wrong, the short seller's risk of loss is in fact infinite. Uh, in a long position, the situation is exactly reversed. Uh, if you take a long position at $20, uh, your upside is infinite and your downside is finite. The most you can lose is the $20. Uh, that has an impact on uh, the willingness of people to take short positions and has an impact on the vulnerability of the people who take short positions to various kinds of uh, opportunistic behavior on the part of the issuer of the securities which we're going to talk about. So one of the bits of opportunistic behavior that the issuer uh, is, is believed to sometimes involve, get itself involved in, uh, is to orchestrate what's called a short squeeze. So a short squeeze, which is in fact extremely difficult to orchestrate, and I believe involves uh, a violation of the U.S. federal securities laws 
prohibition on manipulative trading uh, involves uh, somebody getting a large position in the stock, being unwilling uh, to sell that, that stock, thereby forcing the short seller to search for stock to cover the short position and driving up the price of the stock, which again is against the interest of the short seller and exacerbates this theoretical short squeeze. Uh, there's a lot of discussion uh, in, in the press about short squeezes whenever there's an active public short sale situation going on. And under those circumstances, if people believe that a short squeeze may take place, uh, the likelihood of, uh, the short, of the short in fact being squeezed increases as people recognize that the short seller, in order to cover its position when the price goes up, uh, has to buy stock, creating an artificial demand. The, um, uh, I, I totally agree with Slava that uh, the targets of short sale campaigns uh, will often engage uh, in things like contacting the government and trying to get investigations going on, but so will the short seller. That's, that's not uh, an activity that is that is isolated to the targets of short sales. And what I'd, I'd like to talk briefly about two uh, Pershing Square uh, short sale involvements, because I think they're, they're interesting. The first uh, involved a short of Herbalife, the dietary supplement uh, company. Uh, so in December of 2012, uh, Bill Ackman, the head of Pershing Square, announced that he had taken a short position in Herbal. The stock price dropped by about uh, 12%. Uh, Ackman gave a presentation the next day very publicly, uh, trying to persuade uh, the market that, that Herbalife was an illegal pyramid scheme, uh, which is, uh, can be called a multi-level marketing scheme or more pejoratively, a pyramid scheme. Pyramid schemes are illegal under the US uh, Trade Commission laws. Uh, and Ackman uh, believed and, and, and aggressively promoted uh, his belief that Herbalife was uh, an illegal pyramid scheme. Uh, Herbalife is a large company. It uh, hired extremely talented public relations and legal advisors. Uh, it it uh, sought uh, ways to counter Ackman's statements. Uh, and uh, among the ways it sought to counter Ackman's statements was to encourage uh, investigations by both the SEC uh, and the Department of Justice. Uh, none of those investigations went anywhere because Ackman had complied with laws, uh, but uh, Herbalife made sure that the news of those investigations was leaked as a way to intimidate Ackman and to encourage the market to believe Herbalife had done nothing wrong. More significantly, uh, shortly after Ackman announced his short position, another head on third point run by Dan Loeb announced that it had taken a long position in Herbalife. It had bought 8% of the stock and people began getting concerned about uh, the possibility of a short squeeze with Loeb owning 8%. Loeb owned that uh, stock for a relatively short period of time, sold at a profit, uh, and, and not re-enter the scene. But in February of 2013, uh, at around the time that Loeb was exiting the scene, Carl Icahn, a, um, a I'm going to say highly regarded uh, as acumen U.S. investor uh, and somebody who is a very aggressive investor and had some personal animosity to Ackman, uh, bought a 13% position. Uh, and uh, in his regulatory filing, he said that he thought that Herbalife has a legitimate business model uh, with favorable long-term opportunities for growth. Uh, life stock then rebounded, uh, and uh, as more 
short sellers in the market were forced to cover their shorts, the stock price uh, kept going up. During the period of time that Ackman uh, aggressively campaigned against Herbalife and he went public a number of times, Icon, on the other side, uh, was suggesting that he might want to make a bid to acquire the company at a premium. Uh, he never, in fact, made that bid, but the market reacted very positively to Icon's statements that he might make a bid to acquire the company. Ackman succeeded in getting the Federal Trade Commission uh, to investigate Herbalife to see whether it was an illegal pyramid scheme. The investigation took a long time. As the investigation kind of wound its way through the Federal Trade Commission, the stock price kept going up. Icon, uh, there was a restricted number of shares available to cover shorts. Ackman did not cover. Uh, and then finally, it fined Herbalife uh, the largest fine it, it ever levied against a company for being a pyramid scheme, but it did not specifically call uh, Herbalife a pyramid scheme. Icon immediately announced uh, that the FTC had endorsed Herbalife's business model, uh, and uh, the chairman of the FTC, Edith Ramirez, then issued a press release saying Icon's release was incorrect. However, the market reacted to ICON's release and not to Chairman Ramirez's correction of that release, and Herbalife stock kept going up. At this point, Ackman was in a difficult position because of the infinity of potential loss. Uh, ICON was threatening to acquire the company and act. The activist hedge fund. Uh, announced a position, uh, took the position for a long period of time, had a very significant short position, lost a lot of money on it, despite being entirely correct uh, in, its, in its allegations, except to the extent that Ackman believed that the FTC was going to put Herbalife out of business, and it did not do that. In 2015, Pershing Square had a very significant investment in a company named Valiant Pharmaceuticals. Valiant Pharmaceuticals is now called Bosch Healthcare. Uh, Valiant was a, uh, a high flyer at the time. The stock price had gone up dramatically. Act had made a lot of money on the investment. Um, Value Act, another respected hedge fund, had made money in the investment also, uh, but uh, Valiant had been criticized by, among others, Berkshire Hathaway being a pyramid scheme, not, not excuse me, not a pyramid scheme, but a house of cards, maybe that's worse, uh, and the house of cards was, it kept acquiring companies which would buttress its earnings, uh, and that's why it was showing such extraordinary, extraordinary growth. In any event, Ackman had a long position, Value Act had a long position. Uh, and uh, then in October of 2015, a short seller, a relatively small fir firm with a very small investment, uh, short investment in Valiant, put out a report alleging that Valiant engaged in sham transactions to inflate its sales. It claimed that Valiant was selling products to companies, Enron, these weren't real sales, these were sham sales. Shortly thereafter, this same short seller announced that um, he believed that Valent uh, had a, an affiliated company named Philidor, uh, which was an illegal company engaged in sham transactions uh, with Valiant. The market uh, for Valiant stock went down dramatically. Um, the government began investigating. As the bad news came out about government investigations, both the SEC and the uh, 
uh, and the Department of Justice, the stock kept going down. At around this same period of time, um, a, a notorious hedge fund person, Shrelly, as buying certain pharmaceuticals uh, that were uh, life extending, increasing the price of these pharmaceuticals by dramatic percentages, let's say 10,000 times the price, uh, and profiting off of that. Uh, it was then uh, leaked that Valiant was doing the same thing, and there was uh, a, uh, a Senate committee investigated Valiant's drug pricing, encouraged by the then presidential candidate. Uh, Hillary Clinton. And it turned out that Valiant uh, was in fact doing exactly that kind of activity, but that it represented a, an immaterial portion of Valiant's net income. Uh, it also turned out that Valiant uh, was not engaging in sham transactions. And it also turned out that Philidor, while a somewhat dopely structured uh, affiliated pharmaceutical operation uh, where people were behaving in sophomoric ways was in fact uh, not illegal and there have not been any indictments uh, or SEC sanctions of Valiant or any of its executives except for one uh, who was uh, in fact effectively stealing money from, from Valiant. Nevertheless, the stock price uh, dropped at one point by around 95%, uh, and the short seller obviously profited. Uh, however, the short seller did not own a really large position in the stock. So I say to myself, add those two situations together, and what do we in fact learn about uh, short selling by activist hedge funds? Uh, and I'm not exactly sure that I know, uh, except that I will say that short selling campaigns where the short seller has a significant short position involves a very high degree of risk, in part because of the asymmetry of the, of the re of rewards. Secondly, Valiant had a lot of financial leverage uh, Herbalife had some, but it wasn't quite as leveraged as Valiant. And I think that financial leverage in the target of a short selling campaign uh, it is a positive, fa positive factor for the short seller. And then my final observation is that uh, if the success of a campaign depends on prompt, decisive government action, uh, the result is likely problematic, at least in the United States, uh, where that kind of action by federal agencies uh, is not for the course. Uh, so um, I, I think it's a valuable paper. I, I, I think it's a real contribution to the literature and I, and I, and I thank you Slava for, uh, for, for being responsible for it. Okay, thank you very much Stephen uh, for this, uh, these great comments. We will now turn to the corporate finance scholars to present that will each present a question. These individuals include Alexander Leonquist, Owen Robb, Julian Frank, Wei Jiang, Ron Gilson, and Nadia Malenko. We are grateful to each of you for agreeing to participate in the session. We will call upon each of you in a random order and ask you to present the question and then uh, Slava and Ian can respond. Thank you. Nadia. You are the first random. <laughs> so, please, your question, if you can keep it short, let's appreciate it. Sure. Uh, so, so, I found, um, as Slava, I found this result between activist and non activist hedge funds really interesting. And as I understand, uh, currently, right, the, your main explanation is this reputation for not misleading investors in the past. So, that got me thinking why can't, for example, uh, regular hedge funds uh, also uh, not establish such a reputation for uh, running such uh, campaigns and not right uh, moving the prices and uh, showing that they move the prices in the right direction. So 
Um, as a result, I was thinking maybe there is another difference between activists uh, and non-activists, and this is in the type of uh, information they have expertise in uncovering. So based on uh, their experience, activists are really good at uncovering mismanagement, fraud, right, these accounting man mis manipulations, and this is information that is very easy to communicate and disclose, while maybe other non-activist hedge funds, they're really good at identifying misvaluation by the market, but here, as, as related to your credibility results, right, it's hard to say something beyond it's overvalued. So I wonder how, how you are thinking about it and can it complement your story about reputation? Miriam, how should we go as far as our response? Just if you can provide a short answer, that would be really appreciated because the people can't remember seven questions, I think, or at least I can't. Huh? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll be very short. Just one short response to Stephen. Thanks again for your insightful discussion. And we, it, it was really great to hear your opinion as someone who engaged in these campaigns. I do want to tell you that most of our campaigns go against very large companies. And when we change the value and scheme, it actually doesn't change much. And you're absolutely right. Basically, two firm characteristics show up very significant. And one of them is leverage. Highly leveraged companies are more likely to be targeted. This is probably your intuition and experience is reflected in our results is that these, com these companies are probably more, it's easier to bring them down and pressure because they're financially at, at, you know, highly leveraged. Thanks again, Stephen, uh, from about, uh, about, uh, about your insightful comments. Nadia, um, the difference between activists and activists, I think this is one of key results and I'm, I'm happy that you like it as well. Right now we have, I think the main result to, to explain the difference is again, credibility of allegation. And you're absolutely right. And I think this is David Einhorn tried explaining his book. For, for activists, it looks like they, they want to know what's the problem. They want to point investors to something specific they can understand. Quant hedge funds probably can point to a valuation metric that is an outlier. But a, a little bit, again, this is my, I'm guessing, less experience with giving specific information about companies. We have one test about that, but I think I agree with you, it would be great to expand that. And if you have good ideas how to do it, we'll be happy to, to implement. Thank you. Thank you, Slava. The next random is, the, is Alexander. Please, Alexander. Uh, thanks, Slava, for an interesting paper and a great presentation. And thanks also for um, mentioning our work. So back then, which is now like half a century ago, it seems, we looked at the smaller uh, activist short sellers out there, the likes of Muddy Waters and so on, that I'm sure you've all read about in the newspapers. And they tend to go after smaller prey, often Chinese companies listed in the US, and they tend to have a larger price impact. Now, when we looked at those kinds of players, we found very similar patterns to the ones that you talked about today. Um, but one very interesting thing that we found is that the disclosure of the facts, it's never about the short position. It's not disclosing the short position. It's disclosing the, the alleged facts. So we found that disclosure of the alleged facts only affects prices if the short seller has a reputation for getting the facts right. So credibility really matters, as you've also said. And we looked at uh, that through the lens of looking at the track record and found that only activist short sellers that had a track record of making money for people who jumped on their trade actually had a price impact. So I wonder whether you have looked at track records, credibility through that lens. Thanks, Alexander. Uh, uh, we, we have one measure of track record, which is basically the counting the number of long activism campaigns. Um, I, I think we tried at some point counting the number of active short selling campaigns, but we just didn't have enough power in our, in our uh, uh, sample to find meaningful uh, differences. I think what, what your question implies, it's also an interesting analysis we could do. We could actually interact the credibility of allegation with experience of hedge funds and see whether there is any interaction effect there as you're suggesting. We, we can definitely think about that. And again, the main motivation for our paper uh, to follow up on your one is was indeed to look at big investors and see whether 
similar stories offline and to see what are main differences. And, and again, this difference between activists and non-activist hedge funds, I think this is the most striking result that we learned. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Slava. Wei, it's your turn next. Oh, Slava, very, very uh, interesting work. Um, so I think you, you alluded in your presentation and Nadia also mentioned this. So in fact, I think it's an integrated process um, after hedge fund researches a company and then the hedge fund decide whether to go long or go a public short or silent short, right? So you, the, the activist hedge funds always go into problematic companies if the hedge fund discovers that the price already incorporates the problem, then you should go long. If the company think the prim problems have not been reflected in the price, but the market will discover soon, you should do a silent short, right? The remaining case, you should do a, a, a short campaign. So in your analysis, you view this uh, activist short as an isolated behavior, but in fact, it is one of the three outcomes that could happen. So given you have the universe of the data, I think you can do a um, parallel outcome, like multinomial logotypal regression uh, to see which variable would predict which outcome. And even though the silent short selling is not observable, you can use a proxy as an increase in short interest. And I think the most important, um, the most powerful kind of identification is to find the variables that will predict a firm being hit, but will go into one of the three different directions. I think that will really, really strengthen the analysis. Thank you. Thank you, Wei. Slava? Thanks, Wei. Well, thanks, Wei. This is a really good idea to basically study together the decision to engage in active versus short active campaign. Uh, we can definitely do it. I think we have all data and um, I, I think you, you're right, again, based on, there is one of the results in our paper, we see that they probably first decide to go short quietly, and only later they become, they engage in active short selling with, with public communication. And one of the results that we have is that it, it was consistent with what Stephen was mentioning about squeezes. We see that uh, for some campaigns, there is significant increase in fail to deliver on short selling side, right before announcement of campaign. So probably hedge funds, after they decide to go quietly short, just understand that there is a problem, as, as you're saying, market doesn't get it. And if anything, it goes in the other way, company pressures everything in the other way. And then they decide to go public and engage in, in public communication. This is very good comment, and, and I think we can, we can address it and do it. Thank you. Um, next up is Alon. Thank you. Uh, hi, Slava. Um, so my question has to do with, with um, how you think of reputation. Um, it seems as though you, you have in mind that I have this asset that I've accumulated from being long in a bunch of like regular activist engagements and I can use that um, to communicate my beliefs about, you know, the current firm being overvalued, whatever restructuring that needs to be done. The, the question is really about, you know, and maybe I'm wrong here, my sense is that reputation is really a brittle asset. You know, we've seen, you know, uh, the, the Herbalife case and discussion is sort of reported perfect example that nearly sunk the ship, right? Um, and so it just took one, and it doesn't really matter whether he was why right, Carl Icahn is why right, the FTC did the right or the wrong thing. One event really killed him, came close. And so I, my question now is why risk it? You know, when you kind of sit down and kind of look at the, you document about four to 5% drop in value, I mean, how big of an anticipated gain do you need to have in order to risk it all? I mean, this is an asymmetry. You might lose a lot in that engagement. You might tarnish your reputation. Did you run through some sort of like a calibration exercise? What's the expected price decline that would justify risking it all on one or two, you know, on such cases? Oh, thanks for asking a hard question. <laughs> 
<laughs> I, I think it's a very good question to calibrate it and to think about, you know, what is over, what are overall profits and gains of these hedge funds? What, what price decline would justify this engagement? I do want to think about it. I don't think I have good answers now. It, it's, a, it's a very big picture question. But a cheap answer that I can give you is that they do it. They do it and they do it more and more often, suggesting that the way they think about expected benefits is probably they're higher than expected costs. Maybe they're going to learn that it's not the case and it's going to disappear. But, and I think Herbalife, I mean, again, thanks even for bringing it up. It's, it's very, it's amazing example on one side. On the other side, it's, it, I don't think it's a representative case when two titans basically fight. One says there is a problem, one says there is a no, no problem. So I, I think in most of campaigns, this is not the case. We don't have Icon and Ackman fighting each other. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question will be presented by Ron Gilson. You have to unmute, Ron. That's better. Uh, thank I, I've, I've enjoyed the paper. I have more questions than I'm going to ask because the paper uh, is really good and raises things. Uh, I'm going to frame my question just a little bit differently and sort of roll back to ancient history. And uh, Myron Scholl's may have been his first paper on the impact, the identity of the seller and secondary offerings. And it broke down uh, between people, sellers who you'd expect to have better information and sellers who you didn't and the uh, the impact of the announcement uh, went in that direction i'm i'm the said my questions just depend whether the measures are too coarse uh, to tell us much about what's going on in two cents one it it strikes me uh, that i don't uh, the difference between long and short is a way of making money. It doesn't go to what they're, what people are the character of people, what people are disclosing. Um, in um, in long head long activist positions, the numbers I think it's Larker recent Larker paper is the numbers are positive only if there are acquisitions. Otherwise, the position is um, there's no impact uh, on the uh, on stock price at all. So um, it matters, one, who these people are, and two, what their strategy is. What puzzles me is there's a big difference in the returns to long activists. If, um, depend, if it's long activists, there's only one strategy that seems to work. With short activists, the interaction among what's disclosed doesn't seem to be uh, doesn't seem uh, uh, to be positive. The second is we don't none of the data identifies the, identifies the success of activist shorts in the past. Because if I'm gonna, I if I'm the market, I know something about. Um, who they are, and I ought, and I ought to be able to generate a, a screen that's a rough measure of their of people who followed their advice on prior occasions. So I guess I think it, we'd learn a lot if we knew more about who, more about the returns to prior investors. So the screen is better than just following uh, following a thirteen D, and we'd learn more if there was a way to tie that. You got muted. Okay, Slava, take it. I think I got two questions. Let me start from the second one. Thanks, Ronald, for, for asking them. I, I agree. I think it, it's probably a good next step for us to refine the measure of reputation. And I think it, it 
aggregate some of previous questions as well. We could look at financial performance of previous active short selling positions. And, and I think that would be probably a, a, a good supplementary measurement of reputation for our paper. As far as the difference between you know, returns for overall campaigns versus, you know, when, when some strategies applied. So indeed, if you remember, when we look at active short selling, when no specific allegation is made, there is no price response that is different from just large increases in short selling. It's actually a very small negative return. The biggest negative effect is when hedge funds say something specific like fraud, accounting mis uh, misconduct, pro bad business model. So in that sense, that's probably a similar comparison to what happens on the long side. There is indeed a group of campaigns that drives the results. And in our case, it's the campaigns that this is a group with specific allegations. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Slava. And our last question, not, last but not least, is from Julian Franks. Thank you, Julian. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you. Uh, Slava and Ian for a very interesting paper and a very timely one. I, I've kind of got a comment and a question. When I think of these short selling campaigns like you speak of, I think of Wirecard, NMC, Sino Forest. These are three companies where the short seller, I think, was largely responsible for uncovering a fraud. And in all three cases, the companies fell into bankruptcy. Uh, there are other cases like in the, a bad business model, payday lenders who relied on defaults to generate excess returns. It's interesting, The Economist has written, these cases are a reminder of how markets stand to benefit from short sellers. You know, Bloomberg, short sellers are crucial in keeping the market honest. So my kind of my, my first comment is, I wonder how regulatory attitudes will be shaped by your paper. I mean, it reminds me of the Roman Emperor Vespasian, who in answering his critic when he imposed the tax on Roman toilets, said pecunia non olet, which translates to money has no smell. For too long, regulators seem to have demonized short selling. I wonder whether you think this will change. And, and my second point is really, you say in your paper that you don't really consider these kind of short sellers really like uh, active, really like activism. And, and I kind of was persuaded rather differently by your paper. Uh, this is not about Tesla. Is Tesla overvalued or not? This is about short sellers often, uh, if you like, researching and generating new information. And if you like, if some of this is about a, 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 a uh, a fraud, uh, financial uh, irregularities, or the wrong business model. I if you like, there is an outcome here. And the outcome is the market finds out about the fraud and terminates it, or the market finds out about the financial irregularity or wrong business model and terminates it. And if you kind of accept that, then I think it would be interesting to broaden the paper into what are the sources of these specific allegations and what are the outcomes? Thank you, Julian. These are fantastic comments. Well, on the first one, I hope regulators will listen and, and hear and, and take actions. But indeed, again, as I said in the beginning, it's not fun to be a short seller. Right now, the sentiment is very negative and it has been negative for many years. And whenever there is a crisis and someone short a stock, you, you will not get rewards for that. People who benefit who, uh, uh, are, are, are for some reason silent and, and don't speak out. And people who hurt by that have power, have access to resources, they, they take action. So I hope it changes, but we'll see. About comment on activists, actually, Ian and I have been thinking about that for many, many months. And, and I absolutely agree with you. What I meant by saying it's not activism, I, I meant that they, they don't use voting rights. They don't seek board representation. They don't use usual corporate governance tools to influence the company. This is what we meant. However, if you broaden that and ask whether economic outcomes are affected by this activity, I think the answer is yes. 
again, from my point of view, if fraud stops three years later, three years earlier than otherwise, then investor did benefit the market, right? Company is not engaging in fraud anymore and the resources went to, to, to more efficient companies. I absolutely agree on that. And again, we see this market participants expanding resources to deliver that to everyone and benefit everyone. So I think in terms of effect on economic efficiency, obviously there is a role here. Some bad actions will be terminated earlier and that, that's an outcome as you're saying, absolutely. Thank you, Slava. Obviously, we are running out of time, but still, let me allow for the possibility of one or two questions from the floor. If you have one, please use the raise hand function, given the shortage of time left. Perhaps typing is suboptimal. Okay, I, I don't see raised hands when, oh, Okay, Stephen, yes, please. Yes, so I, I have a question for Sava, and I, I hope it's fair to ask it, given the fact that I've commented, but the question is, did you, have you seen any pattern between the size of the short position of the leader of the short campaign and the success of the campaign? My instinct is that there's an inverse relationship between the size of the short position and the success of the campaign. So a lot of these short sellers, the Muddy Waters, the Citron, take relatively small positions. And I think the market reacts positively to them by, by, by discounting the value of the stock as the big short sellers, the ones like, like Pershing Square, I think have a harder sell because in general, people don't like to see someone get incredibly wealthy as a result of the drop in value of, of a company? This is a very good question. We actually uh, wanted to investigate it. Unfortunately, hedge funds rarely disclose the extent of short positions. They just say there is very large short positions. Sometimes they put specific numbers on the table, but it's probably enough for a case study to compare a few campaigns, but I think it's not enough for broad analysis, but we can definitely try looking at least a few specific cases when they do tell us how many shares are short. Oh, okay, thanks. I just like, since no, nobody else has raised their hands, let me abuse my power as the chair and ask a question which is basically following up on Julian's second question, which you seem to not really have addressed when you, he was saying you in, in the paper you actually say that that the short selling is not activism, but I, I also don't quite see it. First of all, it's actually done by the activist hedge fund, so that already raises suspicion. Secondly, what's the difference between the threat of exit or the exit in the as voice and exit? What's the difference between an exit strategy and uh, taking on the short positions? I know you don't have the shares, but I mean, aren't they very similar? I think, Mike, what we need is whether it's a governance tool. I, I, I think it's a governance tool to address problem with the company. What I mean when I say it's not activism, I mean something very specific. I mean, they don't use, they don't seek board representation. They don't use voting rights to influence anything. It's a very different governance mechanisms, mechanism that mitigates problems with the companies. Similar to X, right? It okay, exactly. Okay, exactly. I, I, okay, I, I grant you that uh, it's not a constructive contribution <laughs> to the firm strategy, but so is exit, neither is exit in that sense, yes. Okay, now I successfully used up all the time. So then what can we do? We thank you all for having participated. And uh, uh, Slava, Stefan, the six question poses. And we hope we will you join for future Spotlight ECGI seminars. Have a nice evening or day, all of you. Bye. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.